So with, um, with that, we're going to let you talk about you and your book. Um, the book is about the book of Genesis, the lessons that we take from that, which is um, as a reminder that Judeo-Christianity Judeo um, cross over in the book of Genesis, the beginning of their Torah and um, the Catholic uh, Christian Old Testament. Um, it's a lot more than just creation story, which is what people think of when they hear the words. So there's a bunch of personalities and entrepreneurs in the book of Genesis that you probably have never thought about that way. So, Michael, maybe you can tell us um, how you got there, how the book happened, and we'll go from there. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, I feel like a little bit like a third wheel up here. <laughs> can we sit this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this for uh, for actually a long time. Jeff Reed and I had lunch together in D.C. I guess a couple of months ago and uh, hatched this idea and just really thrilled uh, to be here at Georgetown and, and with you in this entrepreneurship class. So a couple words about me. Even though I live in Israel, as you hear from my accent, I'm not originally from there. Uh, I grew up in New York, uh, born, bred, and raised in Manhattan and moved to Israel in 1993. Some... Uh, Oh my God, 28 years ago. Uh, in my day job, I'm a venture capitalist. I've been an investor uh, for 25 years. Um, most recently, companies you may have heard of, Lemonade, Wix, uh, et cetera, some pretty meaningful uh, public companies. And I've been investing in the Israeli uh, startup ecosystem uh, for the last 25 years, including a stint at Benchmark Capital, which is based in Silicon Valley, but had uh, an outpost in Israel. And as Teresa said, I met Artie, uh, when the last investment I made at Benchmark Capital and also made at my current firm, Aleph, uh, was WeWork. And uh, WeWork was growing like crazy and uh, perhaps a little out of control. And uh, I called around to a couple of friends of mine, someone who had been an analyst at Goldman Sachs and today the CEO of SoFi, uh, the, the lending company, um, and another friend who runs an investment banking firm in New York. And I said, uh, I need to go get someone who can be the CFO and a steady pair of hands for this uh, company and make sure that it's under control. And they both said to the same person, this is guy Artie Minson. He's in the cable business and you'll never get him out of there, but here's his phone number. And uh, that was the beginning of a, of a wonderful friendship. Um, so as I said, my day job is to, is to invest and my hobby is uh, to write books at the intersection of uh, the Bible, particularly the Torah, the Old Testament, um, and economics and business and the modern state of technology. Uh, I've written so far four volumes in Hebrew. The fourth volume is coming out in Hebrew in, in May, and this one came out uh, in English uh, on the book of Genesis. And uh, what I did was I, I, I took a modern economic lens and we're all aware of the challenges that we seem to be having both with innovation and, and, and the economy today and I'll, I'll dive more into that and showed that nothing's changed. Uh, when I launched the book first in Hebrew, uh, a rabbi was looking at it said, you know, the thing I learned most from the book is that nothing's changed in three or four thousand years. People are people, economic challenges of regulation, empowerment, negotiation uh, and innovation uh, were present then. And I'll, and I'll use one story from the book uh, to illustrate it. So if I asked you, who's Noah? What would you say, who's Noah? Yeah, Noah, he built an ark, right? And uh, that's part of the story uh, of Noah. But before Noah built an ark, uh, Noah invented the plow. Uh, this appears in, in the commentaries on the Bible, but it's pretty obvious when you read the verses. So in five generations, five generations before Noah, there was a man named Jared. Uh, Jared was basically the Thomas Malthus of his generation. Everyone knows what the Malthusian trap is, right? That humanity will grow so fast and have so many children that we won't have enough food to feed the planet. These people pop up in every generation. Sometimes you find them in Congress. Sometimes you find them uh, in the book of Genesis. And sometimes he's an Anglican priest, as in the case of uh, Thomas Malthus. And they're pessimistic about the future of humanity. And if you read the genealogy before Noah, you'll see that the age of people start having children keeps going up and up and up because they think there's not enough food to feed people. Then Noah invents the plow, unleashing prosperity uh, on humanity because all of a sudden you could get mechanized uh, farming and people start having more children and the age of having children goes down. 
But humanity destroys itself because of Noah's innovation. It unleashes unbelievable prosperity. But also licentious behavior and abuse of women and other things. And God decides he needs to destroy the world with the flood, which leads to the story we all know about Noah and the ark. But after the flood, there's a second story about Noah, and he invents something else. Anyone know what he invents? So he did the plow, then he built the ark, and then he invents something else. It's right there in the verses, by the way. It's like not. He invents fermentation and wine. Right? He plants a vineyard and makes wine. And um, wine, very important to point out, is actually the water of the ancients. It was really hard to keep water pure and drinkable in old times. So people drank wine. That's what they did. Um, and it was clean water because alcohol is clean. So Noah plants a vineyard. He makes wine. And then he gets drunk in his tent um, and is abused by his youngest son. And we have a pattern here. The pattern is no one invents the plow and no one invents fermentation or wine or chemistry. Um, and the innovation goes sideways. Humanity destroys itself. In the second case, he destroys himself and his family. And this is, I think, a, uh, a chilling story about what happens when we have innovation without an ethical framework uh, around it. And the same thing was true of Alfred Nobel. Everyone knows about the Nobel Peace Prize, right? And the Nobel Prize in Economics. So why did Alfred Nobel found the Nobel Peace Prize? Does anyone know? He invented, he invented dynamite. And he thought it was going to be great for boring tunnels and mountains and creating railroads, except it started blowing people up and killing people. Another case where we had innovation that we didn't have an ethical framework around. And, um, and so it leads to problems. And by the way, just like Noah found himself after inventing wine in melancholy in his tent, Alfred Nobel dies in Italy in melancholy because of his innovation. Innovation requires ethical framework. And just to finish this out, uh, the takeaway is we got artificial intelligence, CRISPR, gain-of-function virus research. We, everyone knows what that is now after COVID. Um, being funded, but with no ethical frameworks around them. And we need to find kind of timeless values of ethical frameworks. Otherwise, we actually have not just human destruction, but economic destruction uh, as well. And I think that's kind of one of the pointed stories. And then throughout the book, I, I, I deal with other issues uh, related to that. that that's amazing. Um, in, in the book, you talk a lot about trust and how it is, uh, as you said, nothing's really changed in three or 4,000 years, but how you know, trust was so central to either how you know, e economies were driven, how people were perceived. And I'm just interested as you think about, from a venture capital standpoint, you evaluate, you know, the, the lens of which you evaluate companies, wh where is trust in that overall sort of framework? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to address it in a reverse uh, manner. So first of all, I think trust is built and created by working together. It's hard to trust somebody until you go through uh, hard work, crisis, sweating together. We, we did a lot of that. Um, and we normally say, if I trust you, I'll work with you. In fact, it's the inverse. If I work with you, I will then trust you. So we need to have many interactions and working opportunities and sweating opportunities. This, you see this like um, in the military also. You know, you have a military squadron. They carry a stretcher together. They sweat together. You know, it works. You work on a farm together. You sweat together. People do it. You're in a you know all night hackathon by working together. We build we build trust. And so I think that is a core tenet of it. The hard part is when you're a venture capitalist and you run an entrepreneur for the first time and you haven't worked together and you have no uh, uh, shared endeavor, how do you figure out if you can trust the person? Uh, so we create proxies, right? That's just what we do as society. Do I know somebody who knows you? One of the benefits of living in Israel is there aren't six degrees of separation. There's one um, small country, and that helps you kind of proxy uh, for trust. And we have other proxies for trust. Transparency in financials is a proxy for trust. Well, Bernie Madoff, we thought, had, you know, was transparent with his financials. He was sending out quarterly reports every quarter. It turns out the whole thing was a Ponzi scheme. So these are proxies. They're not trust. And it's important in building trust to understand what is real 
And what is a proxy for trust? Regulation, for what it's worth, is a proxy or an attempt at a proxy for trust. It doesn't actually create trust. And I'll add one layer on top of that. Um, one of the interesting things about Bitcoin, I had this uh, back and forth uh, Twitter thing with Mark Andreessen years ago on this topic. One of the things about Bitcoin and, 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 and blockchain is, is it a trust system because it has transparency or is it a trustless system, meaning it doesn't need trust because everything is coded into uh, the blockchain? And I think that's, that's an interesting question for business and technology as we go forward. Are we engendering more trust or are we reducing the need for trust by virtue of trustless technological digital execution systems? In, in Israel, they've had incredible success. They're known as the, the startup nation. And one of the things working with Israelis that has been really interesting to me is you know, the, the requirement to spend time in the military together. And you talked about trust in that in that context there's there's nothing like you know literally being in a foxhole or you know a, a night march with someone what are the other characteristics that you think make israel so success, successful as a, as a place for startups to be birthed um Israel is a ask forgiveness society, not an ask permission society in general. It's like the only military in the world where like there's hierarchy, but no one pays attention. Um, you know, you're kind of encouraged to to do things. And the other thing is, so you're in college here. You can go home for the weekend. Uh, if you're in the military, you can't go home for the weekend. So you therefore need to devolve responsibility for things that college students do onto high school kids. So you give high school kids a lot more responsibility than you would in any other society, and I think that's the second one. Uh, the third thing is, you know, recently they discovered gas in Israel, but until then there were no natural resources. So, you know, the only natural resource was the brain, and that kind of drives uh, technological innovation. And the last thing I say is, um, we talked about this at lunch a bit, uh, I'll try to say this in as politically, I'm not very politically correct, but in as politically correct a way as I can, um, the more you stress a system, uh, the better off people are at innovating their way out of problems. It's true for kids. If we take care of everything our kids need when they're in elementary school or high school, they don't learn any resilience. They don't take public transportation. They don't learn to find their way around if we kind of drive them around everywhere. Um, and being in a more stressing environment, both from external reasons and because uh, nothing works. I once gave a talk at Harvard maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago. A woman stands up in the audience and says, uh, hey, I'm from New Zealand. How do I recreate Startup Nation in New Zealand? I said, well, you can't because everything works. Um, like, you drop off your kid at kindergarten in the morning and the teacher's there in Israel. That's not always true. And so you got to kind of uh, improvise your way to a, to a good day. And improvisation just becomes a way of life, which leads to, which leads to startup. It makes it harder to scale. Um, I always said if we could combine America's uh, uh, scaling expertise and Israel's startup expertise, boy, we'd have something powerful. Huh? How do you think about that in the context then of um, mega rounds that people are doing on the VC front? Because it's, it's been interesting to me with different startups that you know I'm involved with now, I, I find the ones that are frankly a little bit more thinly capitalized that they have that scrappiness and get more done with with less, as opposed to the people who, you know, I was literally I was the founder that who had raised money and it was like, well, now what? Now I now I got to prove this valuation. Now I got to do this and that, as opposed to sort of, you know, plodding along. And you, and you're just sort of seeing more and more of these these large rounds happening. Just interested in your your take on that. I was at Benchmark, we used to say more companies die of indigestion than die of starvation. Um, and it's really, really true. Uh, ingenuity and innovation, and particularly product innovation, comes out of being stressed. It comes out of having to figure it out. Um, you know, we, we <laughs> I have a company sitting on the board of uh, Tiger turned, our, turned up after we had done a round. It did another giant round thereafter. And so uh, I, I called the CFO. I said, hey, um, on our current burn rate, uh, how much time do we have capital for? And she told me 500 years. <laughs> I said, we, we got to fix that. And then you start to ask yourself, okay, how do I spend more money in order to, 
you know, test things, grow faster, stress the system, and you can get kind of tempted to do a lot of irresponsible things. By the way, you came from the cable industry, which was a capital starved, starved business, yeah. right? And somehow that led to an explosion of content available. I mean, you, you talk about that even more than I can. Yeah. Um, you don't want to talk about it already? <laughs> I get the feeling that if I reverse questions, you're not going to speak. Why is that? <laughs> I, I love being up here and not being able to ask the questions. <laughs> I think, oh, I thought mine wasn't working. Um, so we tried to give you a little um, flavor of Georgetown at lunch today. Just wondering, um, after hearing about the, uh, the business school, talking to entrepreneurship people, mission and ministry, um, anything in particular about our culture that you think... Um, uh, you might feel is different from what you've seen at other schools and um, how the book might resonate differently with us. I, um, I told a story, following story at lunch today. Uh, so I left one uh, college out, but I also did Princeton. So I've, I've been now to MIT and Harvard, uh, Brandeis, Princeton, Emory, Penn, NYU, uh, with all these COVID restrictions and everything. Um, a story that stood out to me and, and actually therefore incorporated in the book that's coming out in Hebrew in May was when I was at MIT and Harvard, we did something together with the business schools. It had to be outdoors because of COVID restrictions and 32 degree weather. It was not a lot of fun. Um, somebody at there said, uh, hey, um, he says, I'm Jewish. I said, okay. Um, and he said, uh, you know, synagogue doesn't doesn't talk to me anymore, and my parents' um, kind of religious traditions, as the case may be, uh, don't speak to me in my generation anymore. You know, what would you say to that? And uh, I shared the story today at lunch, and and I said to him, "Well, well, what does he do?" He says, "Well, I came to the business school. I was at a startup. I came to the business school. I'm going back to a startup uh, afterwards, and that's really my my community." And uh, I said, okay. And, uh, and he says, you know, that, that's where I find my, my meaning. And so I asked him, I said, you know, if you get married and have a baby and, you know, you're, you're out for a bit, someone from the startup going to bring you dinner? Um, no. I said, well, you're going back to the same startup that you went to before? Well, no. And how long are you stay at this startup? Two years. And he's one of these equity collectors. And I said, you know, that's not a community of sorts. Uh, it's, it's a challenge because what really the problem is not that the synagogue, as the case may be, or the religious tradition impacted you. You're having a hard time committing. You can't commit to a company. Uh, you haven't committed to a family. And uh, we have a challenge of commitment in society today to anything, a real challenge of commitment. And it's commitment to religion, it's commitment uh, to a job, it's commitment to a significant other and to building a family and to kids. And this is a challenge of the generation. I was at lunch today um, with an amazing group of people. I, I wrote already afterwards. I, I called my wife on the way out. I said, I just had the most amazing lunch I've had in a, in a long time. And... Uh, I think what we all see, and I think what the challenge that Georgetown has presented to you around integrating uh, faith and the challenges of faith and the challenges of commitment together with business studies or foreign service studies is exactly that. How do we bring hard problems but commitment to solving them, a commitment to stick to itiveness on them into everything we do? And how do we find a community of like minded people? who want to be a part of that together. And the bon ton, I'm going to say this right out right, the bon ton today is get married at a later age, have kids even later. we got technological solutions uh, for that. And you don't really need to commit not to your church or your synagogue or your community or your religion. You can kind of bounce around and be a digital nomad. I don't buy it. And I don't buy it over the long term. I tell you right now, get married at a younger age and have families. I'm a grandfather already for what it's worth. It, it, it matters. It helps you 
be kind to other people because children teach us kindness. It helps us understand uh, diversity because it turns out that all oh, your kids, I got eight kids, they're all different, I promise you. And so the, committing to something, to an order, to a religion, to a family, to a significant other early matters in your business life also. It matters in your professional life dramatically. You, you and I did um, an investment together um, called Uniper Care. And one of the things that I think was interesting to, to both of us, and maybe you want to give a little bit of background on it, was it, it was looking at a, a theme, and I would call it a common good theme of, of, you know, how do we address loneliness in our elderly population? You, you have adopted sort of common good investing, you know, with things that you and I have looked at together, um, they, they have something where you say, like, I, f I feel good about this investment. Um, do you see others doing that? Do you think that is going to become more prevalent, less prevalent? Are people, you know, at the end of the day, VCs have to show returns. So uh, how do you balance all of that? Let me be really clear. This is not uh, impact investing or a charity. I'm out to make as much money as possible for my LPs. They would not agree to anything else, and they're right. Um, this is a absolute profit-seeking, uncompromisingly profitable investment thesis. It is, however, my thesis that what you refer to as common good, what I prefer to call long time, term long term aligned principles, which are the heart of products and business, lead to better outcomes in the 21st century. Um, outcomes, profitable outcomes uh, in the 21st century. And so I'll give you a couple examples. I'll come back to Uniper uh, in a second. So uh, Lemonade, who's heard of Lemonade Insurance? Only a few people. So Lemonade is the fast growing insurance company in the world. Uh, I introduced the two founders and was the first investor. The insurance business, generally State Farm, Geico, you name it, um, Allstate, is the most conflicted business model on the planet. Uh, State Farm makes money by rejecting your claim in your biggest time of misery. You got in a car accident, you got a flood in your home, um, and you file a claim. When they reject it, they make more money. It's just like that because the way insurance companies make money is uh, they invest your money while they're holding it, but also it's, you know, how little they lose or defrauded along the way is the profit pool at the end. It's called the combined ratio. And so uh, that's a fundamentally misaligned model. I should not want to make more money when you have more misery. And so Lemonade came to a couple things. One is they used technology, AI, and data and said, we're going to cut out the brokers and go with an app. That's super helpful. Why? Because the brokers incentivized to sell a policy, not provide the insurance company with all the relevant data. But if I have a direct relationship with you, we can find out a lot more, and therefore underwriting is better, and loss ratio goes down. Two, they said, we're going to take a flat fee, 25% of the premiums. That's what we get. doesn't matter if we reject your claim, accept your claim. We're going to get the same amount of money uh, from you for doing this. And leftover premiums will go to charity because most people are good, and if we write, put the right incentive system in place, they won't defraud us. Because you think when you file a claim with Allstate that you're going to get uh, rejected, you trump up your claim. Not anyone in the audience, but most people. Um, and so Lemonade just redefined this business along term, alongside, uh, or along the lines of these long-term principles which say people are good if we give the leftover premiums to charity. People are incentivized to do the right thing, and we're going to be aligned with you in accepting or rejecting your claim and cut out uh, the middleman. It's turned into a hell of an investment. Uh, a hell of an investment. You know, Uniper is another example, and I've got five or six or seven like this at this point. Um, so Uniper came and said, uh, COVID has shown us that people aging in nursing homes is probably not a good idea. That's number one. Number two, people are really lonely. And when people didn't go to visit them, it wasn't that they were lonely because people didn't visit them because of COVID. We exposed that as a society, we've left old people alone, which is terrible. So they said, how do we engineer a technological solution that will let people age at home uh, with dignity and create a social network for them in a way that they can access and builds on their interests and connects them to old friends. And this thing's gotten 
uh, great traction. It's really, I mean, already knows regulated industries better than I do. It's really, really hard to execute on. You know, jury's out as to whether it will be successful. But the sucking sound from the market is stunning. Uh, everyone wants it. It's super aligned. And the nursing home business is just not aligned. I mean, you take the government money to coop people up, for lack of a better term. And this enables people to age at home with dignity. And I, I'll give you one more example because I think it's really relevant. So we talk a lot about student debt. We don't talk a lot about how many individual consumers are in debt and overdraft in their bank or their credit cards or, or whatever. Um, it turns out that the best customer for a bank is somebody who borrows money and defaults on some payments and then ultimately pays it back. You got some fees, some penalties, some extra interest, and then they make a lot more money. That's obviously not terribly aligned. And they're incentivized to say credit. I mean, all day, take more credit, buy some more stuff, buy some more Christmas presents or take a cruise, you know, everything you ever dreamed of. And then people get into debt and they develop scarcity mindset. Scarcity mindset is when I'm running around the hamster wheel trying to figure out how I cover my debts. And that causes us to make really, really bad decisions. If you're in debt, it causes you to make bad decisions. Um, but financial services companies are, are, are uh, in, encouraging people to do this. So this guy, Yuval Samet, who sold his first company to Klarna, which is a Swedish payments juggernaut, um, he grew up very poor in a suburb of Tel Aviv, like right on the market. And we said, we never have a scarcity mindset. So he's going to, I'm going to solve this with AI and a bot. If those of you who have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, you'll know that, you know, they, they kind of measure one number of steps in a day, which tells me how fit I am. He says, we'll do the same thing for financial health. We're going to tell you how much money do you have to spend until the end of the month? So you have an overdraft. And so they built this AI bot that lives in iMessage or WhatsApp and tells you how much money you have to spend at the end of the month. Amazing story. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Israeli families in the early days move out of overdraft and into the plus side. They're creating more investment and savings accounts for their lowest 50% of the population in Israel than ever before by a long shot and doing it in months. And it inverts the financial model because we've turned chronic debtors into investors and it's changed their lives. And I'll just tell you a story to finish it out. So uh, we decide that some of our single mom customers, which is who we started with as a, as a cohort to get it really, really right, um, should come be a part of you know, telling the story. And we're doing this set of commercials. And uh, one of the moms is one of our early customers, comes with her, her daughter, who I think is 11. Um, and the mom is going on, you know, they, they make up to her for this set, and she's going on and on. And the daughter says, can I say something? She says, uh, sure. And as the camera is rolling, uh, the daughter says, did you tell them that Rise Up enabled us to move out of the, somebody's basement into our own apartment? And I was like... Wow, and they've been in somebody else's basement for years. And, but you can, we can use technology for this, and it's a great business. It's an amazing business. Amazing. I, I want to um, open it up to see if anyone has any, any questions. We, we, we can keep going here, but any questions from the audience? There are two microphones, but we can also just repeat the question if you'd rather. Mateo. Mateo. <laughs> are there any trends that are you know hot right now in the market that you think bring up some ethical dilemmas, uh, especially in light of like just general like religious views? You have a budding venture capitalist here. Where are you working next year? Volition Capital. I don't think I know them. Boston. They're in Boston. In Boston. Um, Can you summarize the question? Yeah. Are there any uh, ethical issues in light of religious values? I, by the way, I don't think it's only religious values for what it's worth. Ethical issues come up uh, also uh, for, for people who are not religious or, or uh, of any faith. The answer is yes, and they're coming fast and furious and going to be much faster. So AI has been talked about a lot, right? And Sam Altman is, I think, on this. Um, time will tell. Um, CRISPR, gain-of-function research, synthetic biology, space. Um, I mean, I go on autonomous vehicles, and we talk about autonomous vehicles like they're, you know, amoral. They're not, right? We program in autonomous vehicles who they should kill. That's a real ethical dilemma, right? So autonomous vehicles driving down the street, woman with a baby carriage is walking into the middle of the street. You know, on, on the sidewalk, there's a, you know, group of elderly people. 
standing around waiting across the street. Should the car hit the mother and the baby or the car hit the group of elderly people on the right side? It's got to do one. Hard issue. Um, and so they're coming fast and furious, and then they come even faster. And, and the reason they keep coming is, one, is technology is compounding and growing exponentially as part of our, our lives, and we're able to tinker with a lot more than we're ever able to tinker with. My argument is, is we can't approach this with a relativist value framework, values framework. Because if it's a new values framework, we'll never get to a solution. We need something that is more timeless and has really stood the test of time. You know, and the Bible's been around for thousands of years, it's, and people still read it, and it has more unique users than Google and Facebook over time. So it's really something that people uh, buy into. And so many of these problems are global in nature that if we only develop a framework that applies to Florida or Boston or even the United States, we got a problem. You know, use an example back to the pandemic, right? So um, gain-of-function research, financed partially by DARPA, partially by the Chinese government, what happens in Wuhan may be because the Chinese are looser on the ethical issues of gain of function research for virus. Is so if we don't find something that's kind of broader, and my argument is that um, we need uh, texts and anchors that have stood the test of time in order to get as many people on board as possible, we're going to have a problem. You know, it's like everyone talks about the climate crisis, and I'm not making light of the climate crisis. My point is, if we solve it in America, it doesn't matter. Because if we don't solve it in Africa or China or other places, we'll, we'll still have the same problem. There's one globe. There's many countries, there's one globe. And so we need uh, something that is, again, uh, more timeless and more value centric. One of the questions you could ask me, I'll, I'll say it up front, is you know, the Bible that I talk about. Uh, is adhered to by the three monotheistic faiths in one form or another, but in the Eastern traditions, you don't have it. Now what? I think that's a good question for what it's worth. Um, one I don't have a sufficiently good answer to yet, but it's certainly a better answer than the United Nations is able to provide at this point in my view. When you wrote the book, is it, is it fair to say you, you thought it was really for the Jewish community and you were surprised at how it has resonated outside of Israel and outside the Jewish faith? Stunned. Um, the, the book started as uh, conversations I have with my children at the Sabbath dinner table. Um, and I wrote notes to myself and sent them out to some folks. I said, you should turn this into a book. And he you know, already knows this, but my publisher thought I'd sell 500 to 1,000 books. We sold a lot, a lot more than that. It's, it's resonated. Um, less than half of my readers, I think, are, are Jewish most are uh, Christian of different denominations, uh, I think, at this point. And um, I mean, it was even bought by someone and sent off to business leaders in Taiwan. Um, like the Fortune 50 of Taiwan business leaders got it as a gift from somebody. And uh, I've been getting inbounds from the UK, Taiwan, uh, Nigeria. Somebody, you know, bought, there's a large Christian population, very large Christian population in Nigeria. And... Um, yeah, so yes, I sit down. I had to adapt and adopt the book when I, you know, I wrote in Hebrew. It's much more Jewish on some level, and it's, it's more accessible to people of other faiths in English. And by the way, the, the really interesting thing, um, so like Keith Raboy, anyone know who he is? Founders Fund? He's one of the most successful venture capitalists of all time. Tweets out about the book, every founder of a startup company should read this book. And Gavin Baker, I think you know, of, of Atreides, uh, writes out that this is the best venture capital book I've read, and the Torah is not bad also. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's resonated with a bunch of audiences. And by the way, you know, I think venture capital and technology and startups is such that it's penetrating more communities of faith, which you know, tend to be more conservative over time, but that's no longer true, I think. Any additional questions from the group? Somehow managed to write a book with a, a 
Boy, I'm glad you finished your question with saying the holy grail of work-life balance. That was the perfect tee-up. For all the young people in the room, college students, I got bad news for you. This promise people made to you about work-life balance is a lie. It's, and I don't think it's a holy grail. I think it's false. And we make this promise to young people, and they just get frustrated because they can't find balance and my own personal view is nothing in life is ever, ever, ever in balance. Nothing. You think about your lives. They're out of balance all the time. In many ways, and the world is out of balance. And if it isn't Afghanistan, it's Ukraine. If it isn't, you know, the right is the left. Nothing's in balance. Life is uncertain and out of balance at all times. And we need to stop promising this to kids. Um, what we what we can do is understand that there are trade-offs. I tell my own children, you can only have one thing at the top of your priority list at any point in time. And so um, you try to be the best father, I'm certain. You try to be the best CEO, I'm certain. You try to be the best community member, I'm certain. And we fail. And some days we fail at being a good father. Some days we fail at being a good spouse. Some days we fail at being a good CEO. And it can make us feel crappy, um, but it's a fact of life. And everything, everything, everything is a trade-off. There is never perfect balance. There isn't even semi-perfect balance. And I think it's helpful in life to lose this notion. And it will be helpful to your careers to lose this notion. Because instead of feeling bad about being at the office late one night, Embrace it and say, I made a decision that right now or for the next two weeks, I got to commit myself to this. And because of that, you'll have a conversation with your spouse or your significant other and say, I got to commit to this right now. Let's figure out how we work this out. Or, you know, my, my wife went and got her master's between our third and fourth child. And so um, I was working in Jerusalem at the time. I had to go a lot to Tel Aviv. But my wife gets tired when she's pregnant. And she's pregnant with our fourth child. And so at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I went and picked up the kids from morning kindergarten. Israel, the kindergarten is separated into morning afternoon. Um, then picked up my wife from her master's, took her home so she could sleep. Um, dropped off the kids at the afternoon kindergarten. Went back, picked up my wife, and dropped off. And only at 2 o'clock did I go to Tel Aviv for meetings for the day. Because that was how we worked out. And was it perfect at work? It wasn't. Far, far from it. But it was a trade-off. I made it was way out of balance and, you know, candidly, probably negative negatively impacted my work, but it was a decision I made. And so I, what, what I can tell you is, you know, I, I get up early in the morning to write my books. Um, I try not to have it impact my children. It does. You know, it'd be a lie to say it doesn't. I decided it was important and had a conversation with them about it. So deciding that everything is a trade-off forces us to have a conversation with ourself and those that love us and our communities and our employers and everybody in between. Look, when Artie and I were in the trenches on WeWork, Teresa bore the brunt and my wife Alpha bore the brunt. It, these were long days and long nights and I'm certain we all had conversations uh, about it. And it's, I beg of you, do not seek out work-life balance you will be frustrated and not happy. Instead, understand that you will just have to trade it off and embrace it. And I, and I do think everyone in this room has done that to this point. You're not here by wanting to not work hard, right? That's not who you are. And so for the rest of your life, you're gonna find things that are fulfilling to you. And in the moment, you're deciding between them, prioritizing, but it's not about you know, getting to the day where you don't work hard anymore because you earned it or because you balance it well or whatever, you're, that you're just driven. Yeah. One thing I would add is think about the problem long term. You know, we can get caught up in the moment. You, you really want to think about where this takes you over the long term. That's one thing. So there's a question back there. I don't know is the answer because neither Artie nor I have been there for uh, two years. I saw that the CEO said they're going to be profitable this year. God bless. I'm a large shareholder. Um, so, so I don't know. Uh, 
you know, look, I, I'm, I am bullish long term. I think that if I was, you know, at, at one of our companies that, you know, I'm involved in now, I would not tell them to sign a long term lease. I sort of tell everyone, like, have as much flexibility as you as you can. Um, and so I think what you're just going to see is their their buildings are going to continue to sort of fill up as people go back. So I I I'm a believer long term. You know, one thing I'd add is important to say because you asked the question, are they out of the trenches yet? And uh, I think it's there's an important lesson in in WeWork and we, we lived it. You know, there were ups and downs and sideways, but boy, the team committed. And got this through when nobody, no, no, no person in the media, investors who are on the outside thought that this would get to the other side. So it's a remarkable case of perseverance of you know all the teams through the time that that that, that did this, and you know it's transformed an industry. Sure. As opposed to, he said, "What's it like having eight kids?" No, it's totally calm all day. What you? When they go to sleep, which they don't. I'm not even trying to answer the question. Um, well, I guess I, I had one kid and two kids and three kids and four kids, so I, I experienced them all. It, you know, it's, it, it, the answer is it's amazing. It's so much fun uh, when we get together. It's not cheap. Um, but, but hold on. I'm going to come back to that. Um, but we, we, my wife and I actually... I'll say this openly. We never had a conversation how many children we had. Never once. Um, and, you know, I wasn't always an investor. And we didn't think about the financial implications of having the children, maybe because we were young and dumb. But I think there's something to that for what it's worth. It's part of investing in your future and in the unknown and embracing the unknown uh, as part of it. And um, it, it, it takes a lot of time. Uh, probably should take more time. And uh, but it's it's the most rewarding, the most rewarding thing that you can do. And you know to see the kids trying to balance and figure out their own family dynamics and come together around things and plot behind their parents' backs. Um, and with eight, you can do a lot of plotting. Um, is is just amazingly enriching and and fun. And I wouldn't trade it for anything else. You, you know the only thing I'll add is I um, I was out to dinner with my Georgetown college roommates one night, and one of our roommates had. Um, children young, you know, kind of right out of Georgetown, and the other one waited, and the one who had waited said, well, what was the bigger, you know, what was the biggest jump? Was it from one to two kids or two to three kids? And he said, well, the, the, the biggest jump is zero to one kids. It, it changes your life forever, and I think that is, you know, I've always sort of remembered that quote, and, um, you know, I, uh, I don't have eight kids. I have three, but it is... Uh, I, I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> okay, but for the undergraduates in the room, not yet. <laughs> Let's give this a few years. <laughs> the other thing, I, I became a young grandfather because of it, and that's like amazing. It's like, you know, I got three grandkids. It's like amazing. Any additional questions? It's very docile. Sure. There There's, there's, there's two parts to, to your question, I think. Because in truth, um, what, what you refer to as the crisis, other people refer to as the conflict, other people refer to as other things, has had close to zero impact on the success of Israeli startups. I think zero, actually, is fair to say. Um, there is a very fascinating thing. So way back in 2000, which is now 21 years ago, I backed a startup that opened the first development facility in Ramallah, in the Palestinian Authority at the time. Um, I have endless stories of uh, complex meetups and, and government ministers in the way, but ultimately the company failed, but the experience was super rewarding. And that kind of opened uh, the gates to uh, uh, the beginnings of a Palestinian technolo technology economy, particularly in Ramallah, 
you know, it, all this stuff can, you know, comes around cities, like it's Tel Aviv and Israel and New York and San Francisco. It's not really countries. And so Ramallah is where, where most of it's at. And now you have a bunch of Israeli companies that operating or operated or operate development facilities in Ramallah. And now a startup economy is starting to emerge from there. And I have a friend, actually just got an email from him on the way here, named Saeed Nashef, uh, together with another friend of mine, Yadin Kaufman, who started a, a fund that kind of crosses the lines and invests in businesses there. And I think we'll start to see... Um, more and more startups coming out of uh, Ramallah uh, in particular now that will get funded. The other thing that's been going on, so Israel, and most people don't know this, but Israel's population is 20% Arab. 20% of citizenry is, is Arab. And, and for years, uh, there was almost no entrepreneurship out of the Arab sector uh, in Israel. A lot of this is cultural. Um, and, but now in the last three or four years, we're seeing an absolute explosion uh, of entrepreneurship out of uh, Israel's Arab uh, sector. And uh, I've seen two deals in the last two weeks uh, coming out of there, and they opened an accelerator called Hasub, uh, a guy named Rabia and a guy named Hassan Abu Shali, who works at this company, Rise Up, uh, of ours. And I think we'll just see uh, more and more of that as time goes on now. It's, start, it's starting to be. And with the Abraham Accords, um, there's also more money coming into the country that's, uh, I think, interested uh, in those initiatives. So I, I expect that to grow. Any additional questions? There I get are, to ask you one? Sure. I just wanted to point out, on your way out, there are books at the door. Um, you're welcome to take them if you are going to read them. If you're not going to read them, just keep walking. <laughs> Leave them for someone else. <laughs> um, but yeah, we really appreciate everyone being here. Yeah, thank you. I want to ask you two questions already. Sure. How was transitioning from a big, big cable company in a regulated industry to going into the startup world, which you're now still in this many years later? Yeah, you know, it was, it was interesting. Um, and my job before cable was AOL, which was um, just an ugly public company turnaround. I think the first quarter I was the CFO at AOL, our revenue was down 30% year over year. So I described sort of the AOL job, the cable job, and the WeWork job as the AOL job was the ugliest house in a pretty neighborhood. And we were in the digital neighborhood, but we were like the Munsters house. And you, we, we Nobody fixed, here knows what the Munsters are. No Munsters. one here knows who the Munsters are, like whenever that. But, but we, we fixed it up, we cleaned it up, we got the company growing, and that was an amazing experience. And I always say everyone should do a turnaround once. Don't do it twice. Do it once. You will, you will learn a ton. Time Warner Cable was like your classic pretty house on pretty street. Like really don't mess it up. Uh, you know, make sure like if the house gets painted, the garden gets kept, but like your job is really maintain the front lawn and make sure it's nice. WeWork was like, yeah, there's some lumber over there. There's some bricks. You got to go build a house and good luck. And the interesting thing for me was finding people, you, you find people in life who either know what the future should look like and know what this thing should look like when it is scaled or know how to get something from like zero to 30 million or 40 million or 50 million. Finding people who could actually work with us to build the house was the most challenging thing we did. And you know, when I got there, we were doing Probably about a hundred million in revenue. Ninety-five percent of that was in the U.S. And four and a half years later, for all the craziness, we had built a global brand that was in forty countries and doing you know four billion plus in in revenue. And you can only get there, as Michael said, by having you know we had some pretty amazing people there who who helped us build the house. So we started with kind of my biblical faith journey. Georgetown is a Catholic university. Uh, although uh, multi-faith uh, from, from, from day one. How has your own faith journey influenced your business career? You can answer too, Teresa. Um, you go first. All the questions you ever wanted to ask your parents, they never asked them, right? I, um, you know, look, for me, I've, um, it, it's always been about... Um, You know, I, I, I would say 
I have felt since I went here that there's a Georgetown way of doing business that is like you do the right thing, you do the thing that you know you'd want to sort of explain to your kids or you know your wife like this these these were the facts I was presented with, and this is the decision I made. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you when a WeWork was at its craziest and Adam left, I was the, made the CEO. And I went home to Teresa and I said, I'm going in tomorrow, I'm quitting, I am done. I, I cannot, um, as, you know, I, I can't spend another minute with basically any of the, you know, soft bank people, <laughs> you know, goodbye. <laughs> and Teresa, you know, basically said like, you have to, you know, the company needs you at this point. You have to do it. And we, you know, we went in and I stayed in that job for like eight months. And they were the eight worst months of, of my career. But I honestly, you know, we wouldn't be probably having the conversation of myself, Sebastian Cunningham, Jen Barron, and others stayed and sort of, got us through to the other side and then passed the baton to Sandeep, who's done an incredible job. So we're there, there are times when you have to do things that, you know, and going back to your, your trade-offs, the easiest thing would have been like the alarm clock went off and I hit snooze and said, someone else is gonna handle it. It was, um, and I did that because I felt it was, uh, we had so many employees, it was the right thing to do for them. It wasn't the right thing to do for me to stay, but you know, for the, greater good, I sort of said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck this up. Yeah, I think along the same lines, um, I feel like, uh, and, and touching back on a, a lot of things we, we started with, um, I, I think, uh, you know, you leave Georgetown and um, you, you learn to work hard here, um, but to, um, to prioritize, to make those trade-offs that are really hard. Um, and I think your faith, your family, you know, trusting your gut, all of those things come from, um, from a place of faith and values and doing the right thing one day at a time and, and feeling your way through. Um, so, uh, you know, we wish all of, all of the entrepreneurs of the future and the, uh, and the managers, that's a really important word in the book that we didn't get to talk about, but I love that reference if we want to talk about it another time. Um, and the venture capitalists, uh, all of you, luck in, in uh, finding your way and, and bringing Georgetown out there. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was Thank fun. you. Thank we you. Have a, we have a gift for Michael. Ooh. We do. We do. <laughs> My, you know, Michael, you, you gave us a lot of books, so we, we, got a, we, we brought one for you, which is, you know, our, yeah. our, our famous coach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's our fave. With the towel. <laughs> John Thompson. And a shirt. To remember us by, that we're proudly. I'll you. Someone asked about eight kids. One of the things you have to know about eight kids, my youngest daughter, so I did, I did, it, various colleges I went to, most of them gave me some uh -huh. shirt or a sweatshirt. My daughter, youngest daughter, has a collection of college sweatshirts <laughs> from all these places. We'll she sure steals them as soon as they walk. George Hunt's on her list. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank yeah, you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.